and our subject is good things to come and uh, hopefully we shall at least accomplish the exposition of half this great chapter in the time allotted to us today. And first of all, just to explain a few terms that are very straightforward in the first verse, and then we'll proceed into the subject fully for the law, that is, the ceremonial law of the Jews in Old Testament times, the law having a shadow, a mere outline of good things to come, that is, the riches of Christ and Calvary and the salvation that comes from Christ. For the law having only an outline of these good things to come and not the very image of the things, the reality, the substance and the power can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually. Reference here is particularly to the annual day of atonement and the sacrifices on that day but it includes all sacrifices. The law, the ceremonial law and all those sacrifices can never make the comers thereunto perfect. That is holy blessed, their souls brought to life, their sin purged away, given acceptance by God so that they may walk with him and live eternally. The sacrifices of old could never accomplish that. Well, why was that? Because they were weak? Well, of course they were weak and inadequate, but because they were never intended to accomplish that. They were always only prophecies, visual aids, pictures, shadows, outlines of much better things to come that Christ would come, that he would make the ultimate sacrifice and suffer and die, make a substitutionary atonement, dying for the sins of all his people, leading, of course, to life. Well, the Old Testament people understood that, as we have shown, we'll show a little more as we proceed. They understood that their worship was symbolic, that it was pictures, that it was prophecy that one day Messiah would come and though they couldn't for many years understand exactly how it would happen, he would accomplish the removal of guilt and sin. And they understood that or they should have done had they been earnest and pious and sincere, which some were but many were not, they would have understood it clearly. Of course, sadly, many of the children of Israel in Old Testament times, it suited them to think that their symbolic sacrifices actually accomplished the removal of sin. And that enabled them to sin freely and to be insincere with God. Because anything I do, well, I just offer a sacrifice and it's all over. It doesn't matter and so on. So they thought that these things, or chose to think, that these things were effective. And gradually, apart from the earnest and the sincere, who were given light by the Holy Spirit, apart from those people, the majority of Jews, certainly by the time of Christ, had almost entirely lost sight of the fact that all the ceremonial sacrifices and elements of worship were symbols and pictures of what would come. And here is the reasoning of the inspired writer in these verses. Verse 2, For then would they not have ceased to be offered if those sacrifices had really been effective in the taking away of sin? Then people's consciences would have been truly eased and they would have stopped making the sacrifices and trusted them as having been effective. And that's the meaning of the second verse. But we come to the third verse, but in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again, a reminder again, made of sins every year. Don't you see, says the writer, he's speaking to Jewish people who have been converted, 
and he's speaking to Gentiles who have been converted in this epistle to the Hebrews. Don't you see that when God ordained that there should once a year be that day of atonement and special sacrifices were offered, don't you see that in effect the people were reminded each year that their sin had not actually been paid for, that the sacrifices were not effective. They could be forgiven their sin by trusting that God would deal with sin in the future, that when Messiah came, somehow a great sacrifice would be made. The present sacrifices are only the symbols, but they assure us that my sin one day will be cancelled, purged, dealt with. And in the meantime, on repenting of my sin, God will forgive me. But that great debt is mounting up and Messiah must deal with it. And he did. Christ came, suffered the penalty of sin due to all who repent. And that sacrifice on Calvary carried away all the guilt and sin of the past, the present, and the future hours. But the symbols in the meantime assured the people this was going to happen. But each year, the annual Day of Atonement was a great reminder to the people. The sin which you may be forgiven is actually still there, waiting for the day of account when Christ will deal with it. And then verse 4, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Of course it isn't. The people should have realized that. And we should realize that. And many did. It's impossible. How could an animal and an animal is not equal to a human being. How could an animal take away the punishment on our behalf? It is impossible. The animals have no souls. How can they feel in their souls the terrible, awful forsakenness and desolation being cut off from God, which is our penalty eternally, the punishment of hell and the severance from God? and all good being withdrawn. That is what I shall feel, racked with pain and agony and hopelessness in my soul for all eternity if I die unrepentant, unforgiven. How can an animal without a soul bear that? Indeed, how can a fellow human being bear it without being crushed instantly? The only one who can atone for our sin is the one who is God as well as man, the Lord Jesus Christ. He suffers as a man, but he has divinity, divine nature to sustain him through the suffering so that he can bear away the punishment that I should have borne eternally, condensed and compressed into the space of six hours while he hung upon the cross. But no animal could be my substitute. The animal cannot feel those things and be offered up on my behalf. So one of the great true statements, it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Now from verse 5, a very remarkable quotation. Wherefore when he, and this is a reference to Christ, when he cometh into the world, he saith, and here is a quotation from Psalm 40, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldst not, but a body hast thou prepared me. Let me turn you back to Psalm 40 just for a moment. Here's one of those great prophecies of Christ. And if you read Psalm 40, you can see how it happens, how it works out. It is David speaking. The letter to the Hebrews says it is Christ because as David speaks in this psalm, suddenly he is overcome by the spirit of prophecy and he speaks as if Christ is speaking. It's a prophetic psalm, a messianic psalm. 
Verse 1 of Psalm 40, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. David is in distress. His conscience is troubling him. He's not only in some physical need, but he's especially in spiritual need. Verse 2, he brought me up also out of an horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and establish my goings. This does not speak of a literal experience of David, but a spiritual experience. David, through some sin, some departure from God, had brought his soul into utter darkness and a sense of captivity, but God forgave him and delivered him. Verse 3, and he hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord. Well, he's been transformed and blessed by the forgiving love of God. And so the exhortation he gives in verse 4 of Psalm 40. Blessed is that man that maketh the Lord his trust and respecteth not the proud, nor such as turn aside to lies. And then the almost ecstatic sentiment of the fifth verse, Many, O Lord my God, are thy wonderful works which thou hast done, and thy thoughts which are to usward, they cannot be reckoned up in order unto thee. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. And while he is praising God, and his heart is full of all the blessings that God has given to him, he is given and enabled to speak of, as if Christ. Verse 6, this is what is quoted in the letter to the Hebrews, but it's uh, not quoted, of course, as we read it here in our King James Version, but it's quoted according to a Greek translation, which the writer of the letter to the Hebrews is using. Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire. What does that mean? These are the words of Christ from the mouth of David. Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire. God had no pleasure in, but he ordained it for those people. He planned and established and designed the Old Testament sacrifices for them as symbols, yes. But why did God have no pleasure in them? Well, because they didn't actually appease his wrath and satisfy his holiness. The sacrifices of olden times did not please God and produce salvation for the Jewish people of old. They were pointers and symbols. They could be forgiven, trusting in the fact that God would make a way when Messiah came. And when Christ came, his personal sacrifice, his death on Calvary's cross, his taking the punishment of his people on their behalf, that satisfied the righteousness of God. That gave all the pleasure to God. The sin had been atoned for. The righteousness of Christ had been offered on behalf of his people. It rose, as it were, as a smell as of a sweet savour, and it pleased the heart of God, the Father. So here in Psalm 40 and in verse 6, sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire, not for salvation. God desired it as a sign, as a symbol, as a prophecy of what Christ would do. He did not desire it as the effective means of doing away with sin. Mine ears hast thou opened. That's quoted in Hebrews in a different form. A body God has prepared for Christ. That's the message in Hebrews. But here the original says, Mine ears hast thou opened, which amounts to the same thing. God has prepared a body for Christ and opened his ears 
so that he will live a perfectly obedient life on behalf of his people. Burnt offering and sin offering hast thou not required? Then said I, David is speaking as Christ, lo I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me, all the prophecies of the coming of Christ and Christ at last comes according to the prophecies in the Old Testament. I delight to do thy will, O my God. Christ will come, he will submit himself to the law, he will enter into time and become a voluntary servant of his Father, though he is equal with him as the eternal Son of God, equal with the Father, yet he condescends to come down and take our place and live a submissive and perfect and obedient life. Yea, thy law is within my heart. Now, we don't know where the prophecy ends. Many people think it ends there. In verse 8 of Psalm 40, some people think it continues through the psalm. And the rest of the psalm is a picture of the atoning death of Christ, not a picture of some trial of David. But I hope I'm just showing how the psalm speaks of Christ. David speaks as if he is Christ, and he has come, and he's come to take the place of the sacrifices and to make the true sacrifice, the effective sacrifice. So I go back to Hebrews chapter 10, and I read it from verse 6, or rather verse 5. Wherefore, when he, Christ, cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldst not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure, because they were not the offerings. And verse 7, Then said I, Lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. And in verse 8 of Hebrews 10, there is an explanation. Above when he said, sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and so on, thou wouldst not, neither hadst pleasure therein, offered by the law. Verse 9, it's all repeated again. Then said he, lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that refers to the ceremonial sacrifices, that he may establish the second, Christ coming, to live a perfect life of obedience and to die on Calvary's cross. Verse 10, by the which will, we are sanctified, purified, through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Now let me read these uh, verses through very simply, very quickly. Verse 11. And every priest standeth daily. We learn there that the priests always stood for their sacrifices. I suppose that we would expect that. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But look at verse 12. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. Let me pause with this verse. But this man, Christ, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever. Do you see how it draws attention to Christ? All the priests... And over the centuries of time, there had been many, many thousands of them. And the high priests, all the priests with all their sacrifices, and the high priest with his annual sacrifices, all added together, could not take away one sin by those sacrifices. They were outlines, symbols, visual aids, ineffective teaching symbols, not the real thing. But this man, Jesus Christ, he is greater than all the priests put together. Do you see it in verse 12? 
But this man, it's singling out Christ, is elevating him to the highest position. It's calling attention by comparison and contrast to his greatness. But this man, after he had offered just one sacrifice from him, his body and his soul on Calvary, it was a sacrifice for the sins of his people forever. And then he resumed his position. So we think of Christ, all powerful. I've already mentioned he had to be God. He had to be divine. Or the punishment of human sin, so many billions of saved people standing in for them, that punishment would have crushed him. But he's the all-powerful God. He had to feel it, but his power, his omnipotence enabled him to sustain it. Don't think it made it easy for him. He had to feel the agony and the pain and the torment and the hell for us as a man, just as we ought to feel it as a human being. But his infinite power enabled him to do it. He had to be perfectly holy to qualify to be our sin bearer and our savior. Just as in the Old Testament, when say a lamb was offered up, it must be perfect and unblemished. So the son of God had to be perfect. So when he came to earth, Satan tempted him and he withstood every temptation in every situation in his life, all the hostility and the humiliation, all the trials and the difficulties, his reaction was always that of a holy and perfect one. He had to be qualified, unblemished, no sin of his own in order to be our scapegoat, our representative, our sin bearer. So he had to be holy also in order that the perfections of his life on earth, no matter how much was thrown against him, would stand to earn heaven for all his people. He had to be all-knowing. The all-knowing Son of God, equal with God the Father, knowing all his people yet unborn, let alone those already dead and passed away who had trusted him in times before. He had to be able to know for whom he was dying. He could see when he suffered on Calvary. So we learn in Isaiah 53 and elsewhere, he could see of the fruit of the travail of his soul. He knew the people for whom he died. He consciously bore away our individual sin as well as the sin of all of us, billions gathered out of every age. Oh dear friends, he had to be all wise when he came to earth he knew his plan, he knew where he would walk each day, who he would heal, what he would do. He knew exactly what would happen on Calvary's cross. He knew his people. He knew every trial in which he would show his holiness and his perfection and his trust in the Father. Why, you think of what happened in the Garden of Eden our first parents, they did not trust God. That's all part of that original sin. God is withholding something from us. We cannot take of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because then our eyes will be opened. There is something good which God is concealing from us. And there was apart from, uh, well, it was a compound sin. There was a mistrust of God and Christ in his perfect holiness, had to demonstrate and enact perfect trust in the Father on behalf of all his people. He was eternal. His eyes would never be quenched in death until he chose, until the moment came for him to taste it on our behalf. He had to be all loving. 
in order to go through with this so much love for his people to perish for us and so in verse 12 but this man he isn't like the earthly priests he's better than the many thousands of them he soars high above them their sacrifices were only visual aids but this man was a savior after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever sat down on the right hand of God and then verse 13 and we pause also with this astonishing verse from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool and the meaning of the verse is this that he is waiting and he is acting also in the full expectation of the subduing the conquest of all his enemies dear friends let's explore this for just a few moments from henceforth expecting subduing his enemies Christ is now at the right hand of God the Father equal with the Father and he is currently engaged in the work of subduing all things unto himself that is the work of our King of glory first of all what is he doing making all his enemies his footstool subduing all things unto himself well the first thing that he's doing is saving souls he's bringing souls to himself he's bringing people by his spirit to repentance and faith and trust and discovery of new life in Christ so that we are subdued unto him we come to him we cast ourselves at his feet we call upon him in urgent earnest prayer Lord forgive me my sins I trust in what my Savior has done on Calvary alone forgive me and give me life and how oh, he transforms us gives us a new nature and he subdued us unto himself we who were once enemies are now friends no more than friends we're his children we're those who love him we come gladly and put ourselves under his government I want to be ruled by Christ he is my Lord I want him to determine everything in my life this is one of the ways you tell the difference between a true convert and a false convert a true convert wants to do what God wants I've got to have a new job I've got to plan my career you may say I've got to determine where I shall live I desire God's guidance to me in my husband my wife who uh, is to be my future life's partner I want to do what God wants oh Lord help me and show me and guide me deliver me from putting a foot wrong bring to life my thinking my sense and discernment and wisdom guide me oh my God I want to be under the rule of God oh no say some people they say they've come to Christ and they make up their own mind what they do from day to day they choose where they're going to go what they're going to have what they're going to buy who they're going to court it's all for me they say there's no difference between them and worldlings but Christ is subduing all his enemies unto himself you and me we were his enemies we've been saved by his grace cleansed given life put on the road to heaven and that means we're under his government and gladly and willingly we're subdued so we say Lord guide me oh Lord may I do thy will help me this is not a sermon on how we obtain guidance but just the principle of it you see we're under his government we're being formed into his likeness every week every month every year that we're left on earth before we're taken up to heaven I trust I hope this can be said for all of us the Holy Spirit is working in our lives we're being challenged about our sins 
We're praying for help and we're becoming more Christ-like. One day when we enter glory, there'll be a tremendous final work of transformation and all sin will be removed and we will be given all perfection. But right now, we are being subdued. Christ is waiting, working, expecting till all his enemies be made his footstool. Oh, to be his footstool at his feet through the everlasting ages. Is he working in your life? Are you leaving sin behind progressively? Are Christian virtues, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, be increasingly shown in you as the years go by? Can you say, oh, I am far from the mark, but God has helped me mightily over the years, and the things I once did I no longer do? Is there a constant sanctifying effect in life? It is Christ bringing and subduing all things unto him, shaping his people so he brings us to worship him. He brings us daily to give thanks to him and to praise him and to see his hand in our lives. He calls us and brings us to love him and love him more and owe him our lives. He calls us to serve him. Do you serve him, friends? Do you have service for Christ? He's subduing all things unto himself by the calling of his people and bringing them into his glad service. Are you increasing in loyalty and in trust? I just mentioned the Garden of Eden. That was the fall when in a terrible moment our first parents didn't trust him. Do you trust him more and more? Something happened last week. Something may unfold this week and you'll feel very hard done by and anxious. Why should this happen to me? This is not fair. But do you find that more and more as time goes by, you can say to yourself, but I trust him. I trust him. This was a hard knock. This is a difficult situation that I'm in but I trust the providence of God and I trust the care of my Savior and I trust that his eye is upon me and I trust that he'll see me through and hear my prayer and he allows these things to happen and he knows and I will trust him. This won't be the Garden of Eden all over again. My little life, I will be loyal to him and pray to him and praise him and trust him. Oh, friends, that's Christ subduing all things unto himself. And we see it here in this 13th verse. He's at the right hand of God from henceforth, expecting it's a certain outcome till his enemies be made his footstool. I was his enemy, but by grace alone and his amazing kindness I am now, I hope, his friend, and I'm being conformed more and more to trust him and love him and serve him and please him. Yes, but what about those who remain enemies? Christ has many vicious enemies. They will all be made his footstool. Just think for a few moments. Here is an enemy. Maybe he's in his 40s. Maybe he's very eminent. Maybe he captures the attention of the television and the media. Maybe his face is known to everyone. His pictures are constantly published. His words are constantly heard. His programs broadcast. Then he passes into his 50s and he reaches a kind of zenith of fame and into his 60s. But friends, Christ is subduing all things and making his enemies his footstool. Then suddenly he doesn't change his mind, he doesn't change his antagonism, but what will happen to him? Well, his powers will begin to fail, of course. The aging process will take its course. He will become old and just a shadow of his former self. And he won't be able to cause all the hostility and the fuss and the trouble for the people of God. 
and then God will take his life. He'll breathe his last breath. We stand back and we say, even the enemies of Christ, they've got to fade, they've got to fall, they've got to go and stand before him. He is bringing all his enemies to his feet. And you think of time. The clock ticks. The pages of the calendar turn. Why? 2,000 years ago, when Christ came, if we'd only known, or the people had only known the history of the world, there were thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of enemies of Christ who would proclaim against him, speak against him, yet unborn, yet to be seen. How many are there now? As time has passed, wave after wave of atheism has risen and fallen. All kinds of hostile, counterfeit religions, enemies of the cross of Christ. Not so long ago, people were saying, communism, will this be the Antichrist? It's gone. It's fallen. And we've seen enemy after enemy fall. The people who seem so influential today, who knows? They're the last dregs of the enemies. The great crowd of enemies have almost been spent. And as time reaches its conclusion, they're gone. Like a great arsenal of weapons that runs down. They've lived their lives, they've had their say, they've been brought to the grave. We're near the end of the time, there are not many left. Christ is subduing all things unto himself. Oh, friends, he's even subduing their arguments. They're tired now and worn out. We've heard all the atheistic, unbelieving arguments many times before. Atheism, unbelief, false religion is being increasingly exposed. Time has to run its course. When the final day of judgment comes, don't you see, friends, God must be just and right and demonstrated to be so. It won't be possible when the day of judgment comes for anyone to say to God, if even that were possible, it wouldn't be possible for anyone to say, oh, but God, if you had given the human race time, it isn't fair what you're doing. People are not so bad as this judgment says they are. But time has shown the sinfulness of the human race, the killing the hatefulness, the cruelty, the ugliness of it all. Time has to run its course so that the justice of God is seen to be perfect and right and true. We shall see unbelief, all the trouble it's caused, all the wars it's caused, all its unreasonableness and obduracy. Now, I haven't seen it. But you know, Pastor Mark Stocker of Southampton gave an address at the seminary, the last uh, seminary day. And uh, those who have seen it say it is a wonderful and a superb address. Pastor Stocker was trained as a physicist. And so we asked him to give an address for pastors and aspiring pastors on particle physics and the Higgs boson particle and what it all means and so on and apparently he gave a real scorcher of an address which demonstrated the wonder of particle physics and these subatomic particles and explained some of the principles and showed the powerful evidence of design that they produce and part of his point was this how amazing it is that a whole world of scientists only see in this whole new field, unknown until a few years ago, they only see in it some opportunity for denying God, some possibility that this may just lead to a material explanation for the existence of matter and so on. 
and in their blindness to try to find this, they do not see the wonder and the proof of the designer's hand in this whole new field. And the money that's spent and the projects that are formed in the pursuit of atheism. Well, this has got to be seen. Christ is subduing all things unto himself. And it will be seen the unreasonableness of unbelief. The unreasonableness of atheism. Put in our language, it's like stumbling across a land that's never been seen before. It's been there, and somehow no ship has ever found it. No overflying plane has ever noticed it. And the first people who explore it, they find such magnificence and beauty, but all they're concerned to do when they, go, when they go there is dig up a missing link or something they imagine will, dis, will prove evolution and disprove creation. And they've no eyes to see the stunning evidence of a designer's hand. What an astonishing thing. Christ is, as it were, as the clock ticks, exposing the unreasonableness even of human brilliance, its prejudice and its unreasonableness, so that in the last day, God will be just in judgment and the truth will be seen. Oh, friends, I mustn't dilate further upon this, but as the time goes by, Christ is subduing all things unto himself and we are seeing demonstrated the triumph of the church. We're seeing people in parts of the world who have come to Christ and they're underprivileged and they're denied all kinds of things and they live in poverty and there's no education and yet those who've come to Christ are so deep as people and so profoundly wise and godly. We see places in the world like North Korea and other places also where there is terrible suffering for Christians and people have been executed in their droves and people are imprisoned in the harshest possible, imaginable of regimes. And yet there they are, still trusting Christ, praying to him, loving him, proving him in their lives. And we say, oh, pray for them, and we must. And what a tragedy and what a shame. And why does God allow it to happen? Oh, he will comfort them and he will bless them. But one of the reasons is to demonstrate the power of Christ, the power of the Christian life, the power of true conversion, in that those dear friends flourish and love him and prove him and witness to him no matter what a hostile world throws at them. All these things are to be demonstrated. The devil is to be denied in all his suggestions and his malicious talk. Well, our time is out. But this is a tremendous verse, I believe. I cannot do it justice. He's at the right hand of God. From henceforth, expecting, looking forward to the moment till his enemies be made his footstool. So gather in the elect friends, see your calling in life which is to represent the heart of God and to show love even to the wicked. Fear nothing. Remember that whatever happens to you to demonstrate trust in God and love for him is our calling and to prove him. Time is short, so we carry on with the work of God and we look to him for our every blessing. Why, those people in Old Testament times, they could be forgiven, they could have life in Christ, but while they lived on earth, they had the visual aids, but they didn't have the reality. Now for you and me, dear friends, Christ has come. We've seen how he purchased our salvation. We've seen his love. We have the record of his life on earth. 
we have so much light flooding down to us, how much more we should stand and honor him and prove him and love him.